The Unshackled Waves, episode 147. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. This week saw Australia commemorate its past and present defence personnel with Anzac Day on April 25th. However, this sacred day on Australia's calendar is the left's latest target of abuse and protest. The National Disability Insurance Scheme was back in the news after Treasurer Scott Morrison announced he would not be hiking the Medicare levy by 0.5% to help fund it. The world was heartbroken this week by the tragedy of British infant Alfie Evans, who died after his life support was withdrawn against the wishes of his parents. And peace on the Korean Peninsula is now a real possibility with an historic meeting between the leaders of North and South Korea. To discuss it all, I'm joined by The Unshackled's new political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Tim. Now, you're officially part of the Unshackled editorial team as our political editor, so we'll be uh, seeing and hearing from you a lot more. (laughs) I look forward to it. (laughs) Now, Anzac Day was on uh, April 25th, which was a Wednesday this year, and I thought it would be good to uh, reflect upon the the day. Now, it's, I'd say it's as big as uh, Australia Day in terms of a day of national uh, s- significance and uh, the Anzac uh, commemorations, the dawn services, the parades, they're, they're all still uh, well attended and it's still considered uh, sacrosanct. But as with Australia Day, it's uh, the left, uh, they have to tear down our uh, national institutions. Their argument about Anzac Day is that it uh, glorifies uh, war, uh, does not recognise the, the Aboriginal frontier wars. And uh, there was almost a competition uh, between uh, uh, leftist commentators to see who could be the, the most offensive. We had uh, probably Catherine uh, Devaney, who I call Catherine uh, Deviant. Uh, she, she called it uh, Bogan Halloween, saying, oh, it's, uh, it doesn't really take uh, much uh, courage or it's it's dangerous being in the armed forces uh, and then of course that was also the one year anniversary of uh, Yasmin Abdel Magid's lest we forget uh, Manus Nauru Palestine uh, Syria tweet and uh, Father Rod Bowers the the, the famous uh, Gosford uh, Anglican uh, minister, he he put out the front, uh, lest we forget Manus, and then there was also Sally Rugg, a former campaign director at uh, GetUp, who suggested that leftists en masse uh, tweet, lest we forget Manus. Yes, I heard about that. I heard a lot about that, and I was furious. I'm thinking to myself, this is absolutely disrespectful. The thing is, we don't celebrate, Anzac, we don't commemorate, rather, Anzac Day to glorify war. In fact, it's the very opposite. We take the view of never again when we remember those who fought and died for our liberty. And I know some people might think that sounds trite and pithy, but it's true. We were in a civilizational war at that point. We fought against the Ottoman Empire as part of the greater allied campaign against the central powers. Because of the um, balance of power system, the alliance system, as it was called, you had two major alliances, the the Entente powers and the um, the central of uh, the Triple Alliance powers. And you had to remember that to take one out of the war would be a, an extremely successful feat for your side. So for example, it was it was actually Churchill who came up with the idea. The idea was actually a good idea to take um, the Ottoman Empire out of the war just poorly executed because Churchill was not the greatest general, to put it to put it bluntly. We remember Anzac Day to be grateful for the sacrifices that were made by our um, by our fighting men, and it wasn't just at Gallipoli that we had our baptism of fire, as it were. It was also at Ipers, the Somme, the Western Front. There were so many times where Australian and New Zealand soldiers fought 
and defended the Allied powers against what was seen as aggression. I mean, let's be clear here. Remember that the it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire that started World War One when they declared war on Serbia. Serbia then cried out help to Russia. I Anyway, that's another conversation for another time, I suppose. The thing that angers me, and I wrote this on Anzac Day, we do not remember Anzac Day to glorify war. We remember those who fought for our way of life and our liberties, and we thank them for their sacrifice. I mean, we don't, we don't have... We don't, we don't rattle off 21 gun salutes for all of our returned and... Um, deceased service, but we don't glorify war. We're not like, woohoo, and, you know, shoot bullets off into the air. We, it's a somber day. It's the day we show respect. And for, well, let's let's put it bluntly, to pick trash like Sally Rugg, Catherine Diviny, and that father, Ron Bowers, um, to trash the memory and the sacrifice it's sacrilegious what they've done and you know they're they're a public nuisance i mean i I don't think i I don't support the people tearing them a new one on social media i think some of the things they say are quite vile but at the same time i do understand why they're upset and angry i'm angry as well yeah these uh these leftists that we mentioned that that, they they get a rise out of uh, doing this it's their form Mm -hmm. of uh triggering uh the right because uh they they get called snowflakes and they're like haha we're gonna mock anzac day and you know whip these people up into uh, a frenzy but you know there's a difference between uh you know, being triggered by a non-binary gender and uh, being offended by the fact that you're insulting, what, thousands of uh, Australians who who died in war. I mean, if you look at uh, the Gallipoli campaign, which is the one that's probably uh, commemorated the the most prominently, uh, that had over 8,000 Australian uh, troops uh, die. And so we, we remembered uh, like you said, it's not a glorification of war. We're remembering the the horrors of war. That there there are all these families whose uh, sons ne- uh, ne- never came home, and it's important for us to you know reflect just how uh, dangerous uh, war is. We're not actually se- uh, not all of us are celebrating war as a necessity, but th- that is what we had to do at times. Mm. We had no choice. I mean, we were still a uh, dominion of the empire, of the British Empire back then as well. So, assuming that there was no immediate threat to Australia, where the British told us to go, we Australians went without question and without complaint, which goes to the valour of and the honour of our Australian and New Zealand soldiers. Now, Anzac Day uh, marches and uh, ceremonies, they, they have to have extra security now because of, uh, sadly, uh, terrorist uh, threats and also car attacks. There's uh, bollards were, were a fe- feature uh, in uh, Sydney and Melbourne. So at a time when uh, one of the reasons we commemorate Anzac Day is to celebrate our freedoms, uh, we, we find that we're, we've still got the, all, all this security to protect us from attacks and it seems like where when you think about it where we're not so not as free as we think we are mm-hmm. that's that's definitely seeming the case we've got a lot of opportunistic people who are taking advantage of the liberties we have to try and encroach upon and even eventually repress those liberties so they engage in acts of terror i mean there was a scare a few years ago where there was some teenage i think it was a teenager he and a couple of others were planning to blow up the anzac day celebrations in sydney or melbourne and it was horrific i mean you know it's not it's not something that i mean terrorist attacks are always horrible the fact is our secret services do a lot of good work in protecting our country from prospective terrorist attacks. The number of terrorist attacks that they have thwarted, we will probably never know just how many they've actually successfully thwarted because you only ever hear about the the ones that they don't manage to thwart. The thing is, you know, if we can't, 
you're right, Tim. If we can't celebrate and congregate freely to celebrate, you know, the sacrifice of our men and women who fought, who fought for us, then are we actually free? Why are we as free as we think we are? Now, what also happened on Anzac Day late in the day is that a, a key uh, budget announcement was uh, leaked to the media. Is, it, that was uh, Treasurer Scott Morrison is scrapping the proposed 0.5 increase in the, the Medicare levy, which would have uh, raised uh, $8 billion to fund the National uh, Disability Insurance Scheme. Uh, Morrison claimed that the, the NDIS, as it's known for short, is, is fully funded. He uh, found uh, budget uh, savings and revenue elsewhere. It'll cost uh, $22 billion uh, per year uh, and it'll have uh, 50,000 employees administering it. it was introduced in the, the dying days of the, the Gillard government. Uh, Julie Gillard tried to lock in the, the incoming Abbott government with as much spending as possible. And she also uh, increased the, the Medicare levy at the time from 1.5% to uh, 2%. Uh, now, a lot of people are saying the, the government did this to stave off Labor's attacks, that they were uh, giving a tax cut to the, the big end of town with company tax cuts, yet raising uh, taxes on, on everyone else. So they've neutralised uh, uh, that attack now. But then it seems the uh, Turnbull government, they, they can't win. Now they're being accused of, oh, you're, you're planning to slash uh, spending on the, the NDIS. This is a secret cut to the NDIS. Of course, uh, uh, lefties, they just want to get outraged at anything that a uh, Turnbull government does. They're never satisfied. Mm, no, they never are satisfied. But then in fairness to the... Um the chaotic and very on edge state of our political spectrum from the far left to the far right, everyone has a habit of doing that. You know, to me, back in the day, Gillard could do nothing right. Even the NDIS, I actually wrote an article for Menzies House giving more of the credit to Shorten for the NDIS than to Gillard, which actually makes sense because he was disability services under Rudd before he rolled. Anyway, I digress. Mm -hmm. My point is that um, the issue here is that the NDIS is ne is necessary, but it was poorly planned, it was poorly executed, and you know people are in a very very bad way, and the. $22 billion a year estimate with 50,000 employees. I don't think it's going to be that cheap. And I do suspect that they're actually going to need more than 50,000 employees. Should they have scrapped the increase in the Medicare levy? Yes, but only if they had actually increased um, a fiscal prudence. So that is to say they should have cut, they should be slashing spending. I shared something this morning from two years ago. Uh, it was Paul Murray live from Sky News. He was pointing out that in the past five years, we've had a growth. The Australian government has had a growth in revenue of almost 100 million, sorry, 100 billion, I beg your pardon, since 2009, 2010 financial year, an increase of more than 100 billion in revenue. And yet we're still in debt. How is this happening? We need to cut the spending. I mean, I've always said this, but I'll say it again. We need to cut the spending, especially if we want to bankroll the NDIS. I mean, there's one thing we could do, or one thing that the federal government should do, and, you know, it'd be better if a liberal government did this and not a Labor government, try, because if they try to federalise it, they'll bugger it up. You federalise the sector. You make the you break the NDIS down into state jurisdictions. You still keep the framework, but you have the state oversight because who in Canberra is going to know what the hell is going on in WA or Queensland, for example? They're not going to know. So it's better to have it at a, a state. You need a state logistical oversight for the implementation of the NDIS. 
Yeah, it's it's not the only uh, f- f- uh, form of spending that uh, Julia Gillard locked us into. There was also the the Gonski school funding, which oh uh, the, God, uh, the, yes. the, the Turnbull government has got itself into a political mess uh, with the, the Catholic education sector, saying they're not being uh, f- funded fairly. So you're exactly right there that we should be focusing on getting uh, spending under control. But uh, of course, the uh, the attitude of uh, the, the media class and that filters through to the public is you must make sure all these areas are funded. And uh, if you don't fully fund the NDIS, then oh, you're accused of uh, uh, be, uh, insulting uh, disabled people and people carry on like we never looked after the disabled before the National uh, Disability Insurance Scheme was announced, which actually this week Kevin Rudd claimed credit for because it came out of his uh, 2020 summit, which he was uh, uh, insulted that uh, Andrew Bolt claimed that nothing ever, ever came out of it. So yeah, the the, the Turnbull government is basically scared of the, the politics, given that they are so already far behind in the polls, that they don't want to give uh, Labor any, any, any more uh, ammunition to uh, attack them that, oh, you, you know, want to uh, screw over the, the vulnerable and you only care about the rich. Mm. Yeah, well, it's, the, the thing is, the NDIS is, is always going to be a political football I mean, Rudd's, of course, going to take umbrage at Bolt because Bolt never liked Rudd. <laughs> that much is obvious. He hated Gillard far more, but still, that's not really hard. The thing with the... Um, not just the NDIS, but also other spending that was introduced with, um, with the intention of leaving a trap for the next incoming government, that happens a lot more than you might think so for example uh even john howard did it uh in 2007 in for kevin rudd left some budget things that had to be corrected still wouldn't have put us into deficit granted but it was still a trap there that was left for them gillard had done the same in case tony abbott beat her in 2010 and Rudd tried to do, Rudd successfully did the same, continuing on from Gillard's great work, in my sarcasm, in 2013 with that budget. And so, and what's going to happen is, God forbid, Bill Shorten is going to become Prime Minister, but the Liberal Party government is going to have a couple of traps for them as well. Sorry, the Turnbull led Liberal government is going to have some traps for them as well. I don't know what else to say on this, Tim. It's just, you know, cut the spending. It's not hard. How many consultants do we have employed in Canberra that don't actually need to be employed? We don't have that. We don't have a shortage of consultants being employed on lucrative contracts. We don't have a shortage of money going to um, non-citizens in welfare. We don't have a shortage of money being thrown at renewable energy subsidies we can Uh, cut so much waste from the budget and yet they never do they don't have the vision for it what you said before about everyone expecting this 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 and this being covered it's spot on everyone expects something they don't understand that they are going to have to have to be sacrifices made uh, and of course, uh, whenever you create a, a new government program, there is inevitably going to be people who will want to take uh, advantage of it. There was a report mm. this week that apparently uh, 50 lawn mowing and gardening companies had uh, uh, f- had uh, become uh, associated with the NDIS, offering uh, ser- uh, services to uh, the able-bodied parents of uh, autistic children. To, uh, now, this is an example of a grey area. Uh, a lot of people would argue, well, the, those parents, they, they could uh, find the time to, to, uh, to do that gardening themselves. It's, I, w- I wouldn't go as far as to call it a, a rot, but you're going to see services such as that where people would say well hang on do uh, the, the taxpayers really need to to, to fund uh, the uh, these sort of things mm-hmm. actually speaking of um 
agencies, not just companies that are cynically exploiting a, a hole in the free market. I actually have a friend of mine from uni, lovely lady. She was, um, she's, she's disabled. She was making the comments to me when we were talking one day that her agency was charging her for things that she wasn't actually receiving. And she tried to call, she and her parents who are advocates were trying to call up about it and try and say, hang on, what's going on here? And they just kept on um, fobbing it off. <sighs> they did eventually get it resolved, but it took a long time. It took quite a few letters to the minister um, in Queensland. <sighs> we are going to have the inevitable rotting going on with other agencies, not just the companies that you were talking about just now, but other new agencies springing up. I mean, we had the same thing with the job network in the early 2000s. Most of the uh, time they did... Job work. network is terrible. Mm. Some of them did some good jobs. Some of them did some good work. But others were just absolutely, utterly shonking. Now, probably the most tragic uh, story of the week is the uh, British infant uh, Alfie Evans, who had been mm. struck down with an undiagnosed uh, neurogenerative disorder, which had left him in a semi-vegetative state. Uh, National Health Service doctors, which is the British government-run health system in uh, Britain, uh, got a court order to have his life support uh, turned off against the, the wishes of the parents, who were basically stripped of their uh, parental rights. And sadly, uh, yesterday, uh, Elfie uh, died. And uh, the doctors uh, and the, the courts, they basically denied any of the parents' wishes to, to try and uh, save him, keep him alive, to see if they could get uh, find a treatment for him, given that this was an undiagnosed uh, disorder. They, they weren't allowed to take him for, to Italy for uh, treatment, even though that would unburden the, the British uh, ta taxpayer. They were allowed to keep, uh, take him home, and they kept him alive with mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth, uh, re resuscitation. And it's just all around... Uh, such a, a sad story that these parents, they weren't allowed to do anything they could to save their, their child. Mm. There have been, there's been a lot written about the tragedy of Alfie Evans, uh, some from some mainstream sources, some from some not so mainstream sources, similar to us at the Unshackled. There was some, there were some authors and writers who were saying that the evidence of anti-Catholic bias against um, English Catholics was was um, what's the word was demonstrated very aptly in regards to this case because they the parents actually took out Italian citizenship so that they could fly their child to Italy um, and the, and yet they still said no. All the, the debate, and you know, it's like, why do they say no? Because, was it because of an anti-Catholic bias? I don't know. Historically, it has been the case. Is it still the case? It's not for me to say, but I wouldn't be surprised. Realistically speaking, however, the NHS failed in its duty of care. Questions of bias or prejudice aside, they failed in their duty of care. They should not have wanted to turn the life support off. I mean, you know, what's the Hippocratic Oath say? First, do no yeah, harm. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and they just decided, oh, we're just going to turn it off now. Even though the parents pleaded with them to be turned, to be kept on, the doctor's like, yeah, no, we're turning it off. Like, why? Uh, they claimed that child. was in Alfie's uh, best interest that he no longer received treatment, which, in other words, they thought... It was in a semi-vegetative I... state. How could the hell could it be in his best interest? Sorry, Tim, not mad at you, but how could it be in his best interest? Uh, uh, yeah, it was... They did everything they could to make sure that he died, basically. And they were... For everyone uh, f was who uh, played a part in his, his death, basically... Uh, thought that he would be better off dead, which is, uh, th that's just a horrible point of view to have. It is. It's euthanasia by stealth. The people who are responsible for this are murderers. 
and I will say that publicly, and I have no qualms about saying that, the NHS, the judges who issued that disgraceful, despicable court order, they're guilty of they're guilty of murder. They're guilty of murder. You know, if I were Alfie Evans' parents, I would be suing. I would be suing the the NHS and that judge personally if I were them. That's and it's just, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit emotional about this. It's just it uh, me. It's such a clear cut example of how the the culture of death that's pervading all Western countries, where uh, you're uh, denied uh, treatment to, to try and save lives, and added to that, you're uh, also not allowed to access to uh, treatment for uh, with experimental drugs. If it hasn't been approved by the, the medical authorities, you're not allowed to take them, even though if you, if you don't at least try, you're going to die yet. Uh, it's considered a right to uh, abort uh, children and euthanize the, the elderly. Uh, death is a right, but life is not. Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting because um, George Bernard Shaw, who is one of the um, was he one of the founders of the Fabian Society? I believe he's one of the founders of the Fabian Society in the United Kingdom. If not, he was at least one of the most prominent members. He actually did a video where he actually did a recording, very, very old recording, saying, you know, we will we will occasionally bring people once a year or once every five years and say, sir or madam, would you kindly justify your existence? And if you can't justify your existence, then we will liquidate you. That was basically the gist of that video. I'll find it to you and send it to you later. But the thing is, this is what you'd expect from... Um, a monolithic state with big government, the ability to, with impunity, decide who lives and who dies. You know, in the I mean, he was in a he was in a semi vegetative state. He wasn't even in a full vegetative state. He was just in a semi vegetative um, vegetative state. Uh, and and it's just it, uh, the NHS is horrendously flawed. I mean, my aunt's in the UK, and she has she has to have private health insurance because the NHS just, just sucks. Yeah, it was a perfect example of why socialized medicine is is not the the best system because mm. of, uh, the government because uh, they pay for all the healthcare. They get to decide who is worthy of treatment and of. Uh, or you know who is you know left to, to die? I mean, uh, death panels they they do exist. They they're not called death uh, death panels, but there is a group of people who decide. Well, uh, we don't think their their life is uh, uh, worth saving, so we'll let them go. We're in a free market uh, healthcare system, even if say Elfie's parents couldn't afford uh, treatment. I mean, given the outpouring of support for uh, his parents, the fact that there were protests at the outside the hospital. I mean, they uh, uh, the parents would have easily raised enough money to uh, fund uh, Alfie's uh, future treatment. Mm, exactly. But that's the thing, though. It's like you said before, you know, if you, you have to do it within a certain framework, you do it outside the framework, you're done. So, for example, I mean, this is a somewhat of a segue, um, but, you know, medicinal cannabis, for example, if you rub cannabis oil on them, you can uh, on a child with epilepsy or cancer or some other horrible debilitating condition and the authorities find out about it. it's like oh you're breaking the law well what are we supposed to do let our child suffer clearly and that's why i said it was euthanasia by stealth this is introduced euthanasia by stealth it's you know it's doing things their way or no other way they have, they have the what the ancient Romans used to call Imperium, power over life and death. And it's horrific. And it's also the further eroding of uh, parental rights, which is, in this case, it was medical treatment, but we're seeing... Oh, sorry, Tim, 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 sorry, I'm going to stop you there. Parental rights have already been eroded. This is just the proof of it. This is just the proof that their parental rights have been, have been eroded in the formerly Great Britain. I mean, it's, it's going to happen. It's going to eventually happen here. I hate to sound like a like a negative Nancy or a Cassandra of Troy, but this is going to happen here if it hasn't already. Parental rights don't exist in the UK anymore. 
Oh, they, they don't exist in, in Canada. Uh, exactly. have, have, have no say over your, your child's education, the way they're raised in, in Scotland, for example, each child now has a, a, a appointed a state a guardian who makes sure they're being raised right. So it's, it's basically over all aspects of the, the child's life now that the state uh, makes sure that they're being raised in what they deem the, the appropriate manner. Mm, raised them in the image of the state. Well, they've already gone got out of the society. They've gone, they've gone got out of the society. They've gone monarchy out of society for the most part, and they just have they're just working on getting the family out of society. Thus, your state guardians. We'll focus on some good news now, and it's about time that we did the Korean peace talks that began this week between North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un and South Korean President Moon Jae-in in the demilitarized zone between the two nations. This follows North Korea's uh, pledge to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula and put an end to the uh, Korean War, which is now over 65 years old. It was a historic meeting because it was uh, the furthest that a North Korean leader has ventured uh, uh, south in in more than uh, 50 years and uh, a lot of people are crediting uh, United States President uh, Donald Trump with helping facilitate this uh, uh, historic meeting given that it's his uh, strong arm tough talk which is basically called North Korea's bluff uh, sh showing them to basically with their their nuclear threat be uh, hollow and so so now that they've been exposed they want to come to the peace table because they they don't want to be destroyed and and so now you have uh, uh, some form of uh, peace l looking like it's uh, being taken place and uh, it's 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 truly marvelous to see mm -hmm. well there is some ground for skepticism though I hate to be negative Nancy again but the issue with this is there are some differences I'll, I'll give some background first the um <clears throat> excuse me the in 19 in the late 1990s early 2000s there was a similar meeting that took place between Kim Jong-il um the previous North Korean dictator and Kim Dae-jung who is then the president of um, South Korea and at that meeting Jong-un said let's make history and they did actually make moves towards peace but then it eventually fell apart the difference between that meeting and this week's meeting which I have to say is actually quite impressive all things considered is that um the fact that they actually stepped over the border into the other's countries, that is a huge thing because that didn't even happen in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, you actually saw them chatting. They're actually quite amicable. They're actually quite friendly with each other, which was surprising. And they actually cracked jokes with each other. Um... So it's a, it's a matter of saying, it's a matter of wondering how much of it you can give credit to Trump for. Well, yes, you can certainly give credit to Trump for... Even him CNN him. Uh, conceded that he played a part. <laughs> uh, it serves them, it would do them well to eat some crow for, for, want, for a change. But um, because South Korea gave um, thanks Trump for his assistance. And it is true, Trump has been doing some work behind the scenes to placate North Korea. I mean, he had a meeting with um, Chinese President Xi at Mar-a-Lago after the, um, or just before the last missile test. And the Chinese did a little bit more than symbolically rebuke their pariah neighbor. They actually sent back the coal imports this time uh you could be looking at if if kim jong-un actually follows through on his promise to denuclearize then we'll be looking at 
South Korea also getting rid of its um, its bases where they hold American weapons as well. So it makes it a lot more peaceful. Also gives China a possibility of muscling in. Not that they, not we hope they wouldn't, but we've had some issues with the Chinese over the last week in terms of um, shipping lanes. Anyway, that's another conversation for another time. The thing is, with North Korea, it could be him just saying, yes, I'm going to do that and crossing his fingers behind his back, or he could be serious. I think it's too early to say whether he's being serious or not. But looking at the the warmth between him and his South Korean counterpart, it does seem... I think a little cautious optimism wouldn't hurt. Put it that way. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I won't be uh, completely satisfied by this process until the North Korean people are free from the, the terror of communism and starvation. I mean, uh, they're the, the people who I think we should most uh, ca care about in this, who, who are trapped in that, uh, th that nation. Uh, uh, I would like to see not just peace between the two, two Koreas, but uh, reform of North Korea to open them up to the, the outside world. But obviously that's going to, to take a lot more uh, <laughs> than uh, some uh, negotiations over uh, nuclear weapons. But mm. um, it's, it, it's, it's a pleasing uh, start. And I think what makes this type of meeting different is the, the, the fact that uh, Trump has basically, and he's changed his, uh, I, his attitude now. He used to call Kim Jong Un uh, Rocket Man's on a, on a suicide uh, mission. So you know, if if North Korea, if they're if they're they're trying any t a type of double crossing, Trump, they they know that Trump is going to immediately switch back to that heavy-handed talk, saying, "Oh, I've got a bigger nuclear uh, uh, weapon than you." So uh, he, uh, Trump's unpredictability is uh, an asset uh, in this regard. I have, I have to agree. A lot of people were saying, oh, Trump is a neophyte. He knows nothing about international relations. And he doesn't... Technically speaking, his critics are correct to say that. But what Trump does know about is international business and domestic businesses around the world. He knows how, how it works. He knows what to do. He knows how to bargain with different people. I mean, he wrote, he did read the... He did, it's going to sound like I'm a Trumpist now when I'm not, but he did write the art of the deal, mm. and basically pointing out, you know, how do you how do you win? You think big, you kick ass. Oh, that's another book of his he wrote, um, and he knows what he's doing. In a we in a weird, twisted way, he's acting like he's going senile, and yet his unpredictability, as you pointed out, makes him think, okay he might just smack us down like the hand of God if we don't decide to, you know, tone it down a bit. Although it should be pointed out, um, Gaddafi did a similar thing. He decided to de-weaponize after seeing what happened to Saddam Hussein. Lovely little necktie in Baghdad. So it is possible that Kim Jong-un is deciding to back down because he doesn't know what Trump is going to do next. It's also possible that um, the process, because another thing that was mentioned in the policy, um, oh, let me see if I can find it. There was something that was mentioned in the agreement between um, Presidents Kim and Moon. The one thing that one of the things they mentioned was the pathway to reconciliation in their own, loosely, words loosely put in their own way. So if President Kim were to, actually, no, sorry, that's technically not correct. He's not technically president. Technically, he's just the dear leader. He's not actually mm, president. Yeah. Long story because of the whole Juche system. Um, if he wants to modernize North Korea and protect his own power base and protect the idea of Juche, then what he needs to do is he needs to take a leap out of Deng Xiaoping's book 
in mainland in communist China or formerly communist China in the 1980s and start to liberalize the economy. You know, you can liberal, you know, I mean, yeah, if you want to hold on to power, mm, if you want to liberalize the economy, you don't have to give away political power. Don't do what Gorbachev did. Give them economic freedoms before giving them political freedoms and you'll hold on to power. I also can't believe the the media now saying uh, uh, this meeting between uh, Kim Jong Un and Trump or could turn into a disaster because of Trump's unpredictability. Well, Trump is the one who has facilitated this offer <laughs> of uh, a meeting, and uh, you're you're exactly correct that you know, Trump he's a lot smarter than what, what the media uh, makes out to be. I mean, he wasn't, you know, just some schmo off the street who got elected president. He was a very successful businessman for 40 years who, uh, the, the reason why he got so far is because he knew how to make good business deals. And mm. that, obviously uh, being, you know, unpredictable, uh, you know, being heavy handed, he's uh, taken uh, these methods to the presidency and it's, it's worked. Mm. And that's another thing as well, because both Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump are very similar in temperament. They're both unpredictable. They're both very short-tempered. I mean, Kim much more so than Trump, of course. I mean, Trump hasn't executed one of his generals with anti-aircraft artillery that we know of. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. But seriously... If, if, if and when they do meet, it will be a very interesting meeting because of the fact that they both have that fiery streak. And I think they'll respect each other. They, they may end up walking away from the meeting. It may, the meeting may still be a disaster despite their best intentions, but they will still come away from it with a respect for each other, even if they don't like each other. I think it's going to be it's going to be very interesting. I think he could actually. I think Trump could pull it off. As someone did actually joke, oh, Trump should get a Nobel Peace Prize today. And I thought to myself, well, not just Trump. You'd have to include Trump, Kim, and Moon in that for it to be, you know, a valid prize. Well, I think both of us are still going to remain cautiously optimistic, but the signs mm. so far are, are good. But uh, thank you again, Michael, for joining me on the show, and I'm certainly uh, looking forward to working with you uh, more closely in the future. Mm. Thank you, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Don't forget our friends at Liberty Works have another upcoming event. It is called A Jew, Muslim and Christian Walk Into a Bar featuring Avi Yemeni, Imam Tawidi and Kiralee Smith with Professor James Allen as the Devil's Advocate. It is on Thursday the 17th of May at 7pm at the Mount Gravit Bowls Club in Brisbane. Sydney and Melbourne events will be announced shortly. Tickets can be bought at, by visiting libertyworks.org.au. Also, don't forget, if you want to take The Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Don't forget, we also have an online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.